the thing about infrared that it's not, it's not like it used to be with film. With film, we had, you get the HIE, how, much, how many of you used HIE film, which was the Kodak film, and to me it was, it was my most favorite. But now there's so many different conversions, there's all this color stuff going on. So if you, you can ask me questions about technical, you know, it's tough because it depends on your sensor, it depends on a lot of different things. So um, those kind of questions, I think, you know, I'll direct you to a couple, light, uh, couple of websites that probably will help you a little more. So anyway, I've been doing infrared photography for 40 years. And I started very young because otherwise it sounds like I've been doing, I'm like older and older and older because I keep telling how many people, how long I've been doing it. It's been my love. I started infrared at, uh, I, was, I went to Rochester Institute of Technology for my undergraduate work, and I started as a biomedical photographer. So we did infrared for research and for diagnostic purposes. I worked in a medical center. Um, I realized that it wasn't really my shtick, but I loved the infrared. So I had a wonderful teacher that said to me, why don't you try using the infrared for landscapes? So this is back in the 70s, so I got hooked. I just got hooked. I mean, you know, it's magical. Um, so I had a wonderful, this teacher was, he was my mentor, and he said to me, you know, Lori, I don't think biomed's really your thing. And I said, yeah, you think? And he says, listen, uh, you're borderline passing this class, so I will pass you if you do two things. One is you switch into the BFA program, which was the Bachelor's of Fine Art, and the second was to go study with Ansel Adams. Now, I'm 19. That sounded pretty cool, right? <laughs> I did not know how this would alter and change my life forever. I, to this day, like a new day will happen, and I'm like, wow, that's something that I learned from him. So I learned about infrared landscapes through him. I, you know, you guys have seen his large format work with infrared. It's just absolutely breathtaking. Um, so fine art was my... It was my thing. I was a landscape photographer. Um, I then found myself having two little babies and getting a divorce, so I had to support my sons by myself. So I really did it through infrared. So I've gone through the scientific part and research part of infrared, then to landscapes, fine art, and then into a profit base. So we did weddings, and we were the first that I know of back in the 80s that did in infrared landscape, uh, infrared weddings and infrared portraiture. Was somebody else done it before me? Oh, I, th I thought I heard a noise. But anyway, it's, so I've done it for a long time and it set me apart. And that's what I'm finding now is a lot of people are doing infrared because, God, everybody's a photographer, right? Everybody's got an iPhone, right? So people want to do something different. So a lot of people are turning to infrared for that. And then I've been an educator. I went to grad school um, to teach, to learn how to teach. So I taught college for a long time. And so the big thing that I teach right now is finding your visual voice and infrared photography. So I do think I'm like the luckiest woman in the world because I get to travel, I get to teach, and I get to photograph in infrared, which is my voice. It's my visual voice. So people thought that um, there was a lot of glamour with photographing um, with infrared film. No way. It, wasn't it just a total pain? We had to go in a black changing bag. I'd be at a wedding and it would be 90 degrees out. I'm in this black bag changing the film because you couldn't let the you couldn't open up the film in the daylight because it would fog. So then you had a red filter, the focus was different, and you had a bracket because the light meters, even with the digital cameras, the light meters don't read the infrared spectrum. They make infrared light meters. They're okay. I think you gotta learn. I think you gotta get a feel of what works well with infrared. So this is, um, this is film. This is what, as digital photographers, we're trying to emulate. Um, you can see there's grain, uh, and you can see that glow. The film didn't have, the anti-halation layer was removed, so it had that glow. So now when we're in post-production, we try to add the grain. We try to add the glow. This is a perfect, I think everything's a perfect infrared 
scene, so you'll hear me say that, but this is really a lovely infrared scene. Um, I was traveling on the road to Canada one day and I saw it and I had to get close enough for this tree. Um, foliage is what really makes the infrared glow because it emits a lot of infrared light. So it reflects it so it comes out white. Uh, the other thing is clouds. I love the dark sky, the contrast. You really need a lot of contrast and separation between your subjects when you're photographing infrared. So the sky is on the opposite end of the spectrum. The infrared light is on the higher nanometers and the UV light is on the lower. So in the sky there's a lot of UV light. So if you're using a filter or if you're using a converted digital camera, the skies go dark. So I'm not talking about noise. A lot of our pictures, a lot of the cameras, a lot of the smaller sensors have a lot of noise in there when you do the capture. So you're gonna to have to convert that over a little bit and make it look a little bit more like grain. So the grain really adds to the picture. So I really had an issue when um, digital came out. I took it very personal. I wrote an article for Professional Photographers of America and I said, film isn't broken, why do we have to fix it? And um, then, to add insult to injury, what was it, about 10 years ago, five years ago, that, in, uh, that Kodak stopped making uh, HIE film? I mean, I still have some in my freezer, but it was really devastating to me, so I had to go digital. So uh, this is my starter kit, and now a lot of you ha have not gotten your starter kit yet. So you've got some advantages because you've got some choices. You can start, if you're not sure how much you're going to like it or you want to start with what you already have, instead of converting over a camera, you can go with a filter. So Fuji at the time was sponsoring me. So I had an S2 camera. You have to check with your digital camera. You can go onto LifePixel and some of the other places to find out what cameras can work with a filter. And so I got, uh, I had the S2 and I used a 72 filter, which is opaque. You can go higher, the higher you go. Really, the number 72 means it goes to that nanometer, 720. So you can go up into the 80s if you want. Um, so the filter really works well. It's a good start, but you need a tripod because when you put that filter over the camera, what's going to happen is that you can't see through the lens. So it's fine because you have long exposures. If you're photographing landscapes, it's not going to matter that much because you don't have to tell a person to hold their breath and not move. But it can mean if there's wind, you'll get a certain effect. And if you're doing running water, which is really quite lovely, then you will have that long kind of dreamy like look. Um, the focus. I totally recommend that you focus before you put the filter on because you really can't see, see through the camera. It's like, what happened? And then the nice thing here, okay, so now I'm gonna tell you, I told you like my disappointment that film was done. Now here's why I love digital infrared. And part of it is because of, you can see it. You can tell right away whether you're within a range with the exposures. With a film, you had a bracket. So if you had a 36 exposure film, the film was $15. Um, if you had 36 exposures and you bracketed, you know, so you had, you could maybe get four or five or six different frames, you know, images per roll, but now you don't have to worry about it. And the gift to me is that I, it became kind of like, I didn't want to ruin or, you know, waste film because of the expense. So now with a digital, I'm trying things that I've never tried before. I'm trying long exposures. I'm doing things to break the rules. Now again, I believe you learn the rules so you can break them. So um, the digital is wonderful because you, and you, and yeah, that whole instant gratification thing. So again, non-moving landscape, it works really well. So when I was working on this talk, um, I'm not a good speller, so I said to Siri, can you spell conversion for me? And instead, Siri gave me a definition which I thought was wonderful and it like resonated so I thought it sh I'd share it with you. So it says, an event that results in a transformation. And I gotta tell you, when I started doing digital infrared, it was a transformation. Exactly for what I said before, I could get out of my box more. I shot more infrared. It used to be because it was so expensive, um, it was really hard, you know, you just didn't know, you, you kinda got protective of it. 
So um, there's two websites that I'm going to recommend to you. I can't go over all of um, the different technical pieces. There's just too, too much information. Also, it's specific to everybody in here. Um, so LifePixel, I am an affiliate. If you did, um, if you do go to them, please put my name in for affiliate. It's Lori Klein Infrared. I get infrared conversions. I mentor a lot of high school kids, so it allows me to get extra uh, cameras. But with LifePixel, you don't have to go to them for conversion. They're, when I'm talking out in, um, at the booth at Canon, I will be handing out a local place that does the conversions. Um, so the conversions, uh, well, the thing with LifePixel is you go onto their site if you, and they really show you the different options you have, which is really great. If you like the color, if you want the lower nanometers, and they give you great descriptions on how to do post-production. So it's a really great resource, and I'm going to warn you, we're, my son Kyle and I are working on um, our second infrared book, and we were doing a lot of research on the web. There is a lot of misinformation. Um, I had Larry and Joanne come up to me from Pennsylvania that came up to hear us talk today. And they were talking about, well, they read something about, you know, it taking really long exposures and, you know, so th there was a cross communication. It, probably what it was, the long exposure was they were talking about a filter. But do your research. The other thing that I think is really important is um, what do you want? What do you like? Um, I use the 720, which is a standard conversion. I like that. It works for me. Um, and then I sometimes suggest people start with the black and white, and then if they want to add color, at least they know what a good infrared scene looks like. So camera and lenses. I find most people are using a camera that's sitting on the, front of the, the shelf, collecting dust. What happens is that we have all these old cameras, right? And we don't know what to do with them, so we'll convert them over. And that's a really good start because it's not cost costing you any more. You know, me, I want to get a 5D Mark III and convert it over, which a lot of people think is crazy, but my predominant, you know, voice is through infrared. I do use DC DSLRs. Um, I like them. But you can also use mirrorless cameras, and I think mirrorless are really great. I'm finding after shooting so long that my neck is bothering me a little bit. So the uh, mirrorless uh, do work. I think I lost the bottom there. Um, live view is really wonderful um, when you're, you've got to convert your lens over with your camera because for those of you that did do film, you know, remember that red dot on your lens or it had an R? You had to actually change your lens over to that in order to get the focus right because the focus, you focus differently than you focus with um, regular film. So you've got to send your lens in to be calibrated with that camera. Um, so I like the wider angle lenses. That's totally up to you. One of the things that I'm finding when, when we shot film, we were shooting fixed focal length. Like my, my favorite lens is 24, 28, and 35. And now I use a 17 to uh, 40. But the focus is going to be different between the 17 and the 40. So when you get the conversion, they're going to go to a, probably the lower millimeter, and that's what they're going to um, make the focus work with with your camera. With live view and with my 7D, I have live view. With live view, it focuses on the sensor, so it's more accurate. So you don't have to send your lens in, but then that presents another problem, and that's that um, you get artifacts, which we'll talk more about in a second. So the other, the other thing for uh, research is infrared100.org. It's um, Andy Finney, and he's out of the UK. And this guy has been around for many, many years doing research and talking about infrared. So if you're kind of geeky and really like to know some of the behind the scenes things with the infrared and um, the scientific applications for it, go to that site. It's just a plethora of information. So which nanometer do you want to do? Like I said, I would do research. Um, go on, there's a lot of uh, Facebook uh, pages that are just dedicated to infrared. See what kind of images you like. When you, they, they list what nanometer they're converted to, they list what 
um, equipment they're using. And when you see something you like, figure it out. Because I, I'll tell you, I mean, if you want me to tell you what to do, I will. I would go with 720 nanometer. But if you want to do this color stuff and you want to uh, be able to do the, po and you're good with the post-production, then go for a different um, conversion. So the nanometers, you know, the infrared spectrum is higher than the visible light. So it's a range. So the lower the nanometer, it won't get quite the infrared quality. And then the higher the nanometer, when you get up into the 800s, you've got to be very careful if you are doing portraits because the veining is going to come out more. So it has a different look. So this isn't something that, I mean, when I go, you know, come to Cuba with me. I'm going to be teaching a class there. And we can try different cameras so that you can see what you might like and what might work for you. But it's a very personal preference. Um, OK, so this is, I have a few cameras that I have converted over. This is a G11 before I dropped it in the lake. <laughs> yeah, the day after, you know, I had it about a week. And they, had, they take off the strap. So uh, I didn't put the strap back on. But this is the way it comes out. Now, you can get these colors in a, no, a number of different ways. This hasn't been, this has just gone raw, into raw, and no color change has been made. But you can tweak this later on. And the one thing that I love about infrared is there's always a surprise. I mean, again, I've been doing infrared for 40 years. I didn't know how the mica was going to look. I mean, it's wacky. So there's always that surprise. Um, and a lot of people, like I said, like the color. They do channel swapping. They do enhancing. There's a lot of things that you can do. This is what I like. This is what I do. I like the black and white. You know, the thing is, is that when, you know, when I was shooting like weddings, I'd have two infrared cameras going, I'd have a Hasselblad, and I'd have a color camera going. So when I wanted to sh take a color shot, I would take a specific camera up, and I knew that I would have to shoot in color because you have to look at things differently. The capture is different. And people don't do that now. It's digital. Oh, I'll figure out later whether I'm going to do color or black and white. I don't quite understand that concept because we don't have the color as a shape. So it's with infrared, you got to learn what the composition is. Like, I love this tree. This is in Florida. And I just loved how, you know, it was just drippy and just beautiful and, and the, the space up there, look at the heart, the upside down heart. So the composition really works in infrared. It was a dark deep blue sky so it was absorbing the UV and making it dark. So when you get your camera out of the box, um, I put this up because I want to make sure, this is, this is a problem that I find with a lot of my students. You do not want auto white balance. You want custom white balance. Most of the time when you get your cameras back, it's already set for that. But what I find with a lot of my Nikon using students is that sometimes they have to rebalance their, um, they need to, need to rebalance, recalibrate their camera. Um, so make sure you're on custom <coughs> white balance. If you're not, this is what the picture's going to look like. Now, it's on the back of the screen, so you can, if you're in RAW, which I totally recommend, like you shouldn't do anything but RAW with infrared, um, but this is the way it should look. I have friends that keep it on auto or don't do the white balance, the, uh, you know, they do the auto white balance and they're getting colors like this. Um, ISO, I recommend 400 or lower. It depends on your camera. If your camera is a um, older camera, smaller mix, megapixels, then go to the lower ISO. If you have like a full frame sensor, you can go higher. But usually I use um, 400. You got to shoot raw because infrared needs a lot of post production work, a lot. You're photographing main, most of the stuff in infrared are the highlights, but you need the contrast. So you need to have that extra data. So that's why you need to do raw. Histograms. Like I said, the light meters really are not going to read the non-visible spectrum. So the histograms are what you have to use. And the histograms in live feed, it's more accurate because you're seeing it right then and there when you're moving around. Um, if I could with my students, I would block off that back screen because I find people shooting and then they look down. So it's getting out of their left brain, uh, they're into their left brain and out of their right brain. So when you've got a scene, unless the, the clouds that come in, your light changes, or you move around, you, once you get the exposure right, you should be fine. And when in doubt, bracket. 
and I'll talk more about bracketing. Also, I keep my camera on manual mode basically because I need to tweak it because I do not trust the meter again. And when you're on automatic or aperture preferred, any of those, you sometimes, like on the program, you'll get a funky um, color. But if you're on uh, aperture preferred, for example, then what's going to happen is you are going to, um, you can't tweak it. You know, you can do over, you know, you can do the exposure compensation by two stops, but you might need two and a half stops. It depends on the time of day. It depends on the time of year. Infrared changes because of how much reflective infrared light there is. Um, the hardest thing to me to teach is how to pre-visualize an infrared. By doing it so long, I've, I can. I know basically what my scene will look like, but I also get a surprise. So this is what my images look like when I get it out of um, camera, when I download it into Camera Raw. I get a little bit of purple there. Now this is not a typical good infrared scene because it has rocks. This is in Cabo and um, the rocks don't, they absorb, they're cold, they absorb light so they're not going to radiate any infrared light off. But I went, and the same is true with the water, but I went for the clouds. I like the drama. So this is how it comes out when I've converted, gotten rid of the color cast, which I usually do, and this is post-production. So this is what I mean. You can see the difference, right, on the screen? Okay, so this is what I need. You need to add more drama. You've got to get the blacks really good, and you have to make sure the whites are good. So you want your histogram to be very long. You just don't want it touching on either side, because if it is, you know you're going to lose space. You're going to lose um, information. But the highlight area is really what infrared is all about. Um, I love a lot of depth. I just, uh, you know, it, it's what works for me. So I usually pick wide angle lenses, uh, shorter lenses. I want as much depth of field as possible, so I'm trying to go around F22. Now this is a pretty cool scene because you can see how the wire of the, ra of the ramp railing, that turned dark because it doesn't emit light. So this is something that you have to pay attention to where there's shadows, it'll go darker, but this was just a perfect infrared scene in that it had so much glow because there was a lot of foliage that was emitting infrared light. Okay, lenses, like I said to you before, I don't recommend you changing your lens. I still have to uh, get my camera cleaned uh, almost once a year um, because you see little dots up there? Those are artifacts. Infrared is prone to it because when they convert the cameras over, they disconnect the cleaning sensor, so or the cleaner. So you, you can't clean your cameras. That, you know you, you press that button and nothing's going to happen. So you've got to get it cleaned. Now some people clean their own s cameras. I don't recommend it. Uh, the sensor is delicate. And the other thing I didn't talk about, but you can convert your own cameras over. It's tedious and you've got to be careful because if you do it wrong, it's over. You also know once you convert over a camera, there's no going back. So there's also a little bit of, um, you see right in the middle, there's a little bit of flare. That happens with infrared and we'll talk about that. So I got rid of all that stuff, but I don't want to spend a lot of time in Photoshop. So I want to try to get, uh, I'm a capture person. I do very little, I mean, a very little after capture work just to make, like, my after capture is darkroom work. So this is what it looks like. It looks very different when you're using a telephoto lens or a longer than normal lens because what's happening, it's flattening out. And I like things in focus with my infrared. So here are three different scenes so you can see what happens with the background in infrared. So my recommendation, depending, you know, most people do scenics. So with the infrared, so you do want a lot of depth of field and a small f-stop. So what reflects the most light? One of the things that I do suggest you do is, this is an iPhone shot. So I was in Honduras um, in March and I never photographed monkeys before. Now I knew what the foliage was going to look like. The foliage would turn light, right? Because it's emitting the infrared so it's going to go on the wide end of the spectrum. I didn't know what the monkey would do. I knew that it would probably go dark because of its coat, but it's, part of its coat has red in it, has a lot of red in it. So the other thing is colors. When you're dealing with wavelengths like the reds, yellows, that's going to be up towards the infrared where the blues and the greens are down towards the UV, so they're going to go dark. Where in 
infrared is going to go light. The big challenge that I knew would be with this picture would be its background because there's a lot of trees and branches. So I didn't want it cutting off the movement of the image. So I had to make sure that it was placed right with the, with the uh, monkey. This is my final picture. Now, um, I can't point to it, but you see over right, if you follow the monkey's eye up a little bit, all that dark area, you know what that is? It's a dead branch. It was, it's dead, so it's not emitting any IR. So uh, there's so much you've got to think about. The biggest thing with infrared is contrast, separation. I knew that if I didn't, ha if I had the monkey in a different place, it would have gotten lost. You'll see it. I have a set of Macau parrots. Uh, uh, is there Macau? Macraw. Macraw. Parrots that it, it blended in. You couldn't see the separation. So you really have to get in a spot. Like if you want this monkey and it was just a sky in the background, there wouldn't be a lot of separation. And I do recommend you doing this because you can go back and look at the color image and the black and white image. That's how you're going to learn how infrared sees. I can, I can tell you, but it's not going to mean anything. You've got to experience it. And that's the beauty of digital. You're not wasting film. So anyway, I'm sorry. This is in Andros Island in the Bahamas. Um, I went here. I knew I was going to photograph here. I went in the morning, and I knew the lighting was out, was wrong. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is there are numerous trees in there, so they emit different types of light. So I waited till dusk low sun. This is in January. So the weather, the time of year, all that really matters with infrared. When you're doing digital cameras, you don't want to shoot midday, do you? No, I do. I love that 12 o'clock moon, you know, in June. It really works for me. So anyway, um, these are the parrots. Now because you've got complementary colors of the green behind the parrots' heads, there's a separation. You lose it with the infrared. I also want you to see the succulents that are on, growing off the, the trees there. They come out darker because they don't emit as much IR. So you can barely see the parrots, right? There's no uh, separation. But look at the blues. They come out black. And the reds and oranges and yellows come out white. So don't you see how this is a really good, uh, a good tool for you guys to learn from? Wow, that was enthusiastic. <laughs> OK, we'll talk about flare and hot spots then. <laughs> so flare and hot spots. Also, again, um, do your research. Um, some of the, the lenses are coded for the, the visible spectrum. So they're not coded for IR. So they have a great propensity for flare. Hot spots, you can go on LifePixel and I'm sure other places and find out which lenses have hot spots. That means this is a little point and shoot camera. So right in the middle, you got a hot spot. It's very, very hard to fix that in Photoshop. Flare, sometimes it works. It works here when you, I'm sorry. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So what I use is I use a lens hood or I use my hand, and you can see on the upper right corner is my hand. So you have to be very careful. Or if I have an assistant with me, I use their body to block the sun. That works. Um, this was one done by my son also, and it worked. Photographing right in the sun is really dangerous. Again, learn the rules so you can break them. Foliage, that's what it's all about with infrared. Um, the other thing, too, to see is that the bark is going to go darker because it's not emitting IR. And yet, in the shadow area, because there's no light on it, you're going to get even a darker tone. Um, this is off of a Lumex mirrorless camera. This was with low light. There was not a lot of sun that day. It was overcast. But I knew that the foliage would produce contrast. I know I have to have contrast in my scene. So I knew the water would stay dark because it was cold and it was a rocky bottom. So there's no reflectance. And I also knew I had a lot of rhythm in this image by the composition of the repetition of the trees. This is an image, if you put it upside down, it still works. Um, conifers and evergreens are much different than deciduous trees. They do not emit much infrared light. There's not a lot of infrared reflectance off of them. So it's really good. That's why I put this picture in, because you can see the different trees and how they go dark. You're not getting that look that we saw in, um, in the deciduous trees before. 
they're still fun to photograph. So um, when I was in Honduras, I saw these trees, um, and I knew I was going to be giving this talk. And there must have been a blight to these palm trees. But it was a perfect example for me to show you where the palms were dead, they came out dark. So there was two things that really worked for me as a teaching tool. One is to show when something is not living. Chlorophyll has a little bit to do with it. Not, you know, not a huge amount, but it's part in the equation of what is more reflective infrared. So the, um, the sky made a difference. I wanted there to be a separation between the dead tree leaves, palm fronds, and the background. If there was no clouds, the, cl the sky would have gone totally dark and I wouldn't have a separation. But with the cloud cover, there was a separation between the dead palms and the sky. If I did it the other way around, the light palms that had still a lot of chlorophyll and a lot of reflective infrared, they would have stood out more. So it's something to think about. It's not just going out and doing something unique and taking an infrared shot. You've got to understand it. My emu. All right, well, I hadn't planned on photographing the emu, but it came running at me when I was photographing this scene. I was in Napa um, last April. Um, Fruit trees are some of the best to photograph in infrared. And being in the Northeast, we have a lot of them. So, um, but the big thing about the emu and why I put it in there is that if his head was any higher, because there's a road back there and there's a fence that comes out dark, there wouldn't have been any separation. So if I could give you one compositional tool today, it's pay attention to the separation. Um, you'll see in a little while in, about how moving over one spot can really make a difference. I love clouds. Um, I photograph and um, I teach at Santa Fe Photographic Workshop. I do a creative infrared class. And I went out there. I hadn't been there in years. I forgot there are not much, there's not much grass or deciduous trees there. We've got cottonwoods, but it's really a hard thing for infrared. So I just, I was there during monsoon time. So it was really, it was fantastic because I went for the clouds. And you have to wait for the clouds to be in the right place. And what was nice is that we were at a high elevation, so there wasn't a lot of haze or UV light, so the sky went dark. This is Alaska. Um, the clouds have to just be in the right place. Water and reflection, I love to photograph water. Um, if you if go to my site, there's a lot of bodies in water, so the bodies just glow and the water usually goes dark. It depends whether you're in a pool and a lot of other things. But again, I like photographs that if you turn them upside down, they work just as well. Um, Tahoe. Uh, it took me a while to find the right picture of the lake. I knew the lake would go black. This is late winter. And I knew the pine trees, where there was light, they'd be light. And where it was dark, they'd be darker. But I wanted to showcase the, like, to me, the lake looks like kind of like a whale, right? So I wanted that to really shine. So I didn't want too much else going on. So this is the picture that I took. Bracketing. Um, how many of you have done bracketing with IR? OK, um, so you can't get everything. This is basically HDR for me. Um, it was dusk, not a really great time of day to do infrared. I was on a tripod. I usually do uh, half-stop increments, um, and then I merge them. You can merge them Lightroom, uh, Nick filters. There's lots of different uh, use of, uh, things that you can do. And something like this, I was on uh, manual. But when I do something like this, and I'm in um, New Mexico, and I didn't have a tripod with me, I don't know what I was thinking, but I didn't have a tripod, um, I had to hand hold it. So you can, that's where I'll go to auto bracket and go you know, plus, minus, and then I merge it together. To me, what works of this image, I waited. I waited till the cloud was coming out of the chimney. I learned that from Ansel. You, you know, if you guys have read about him, he waited for a storm to come in. He waited for the clouds to be in the right place. So the only way that I could get, I mean, infrared likes dramatic scenes and it likes a lot of contrast, but it needs, you know, it needs a little help sometimes because there was so much shadow on the uh, cabin. So for me to get the cabin and for me to get details in the highlights and the clouds, I had to bracket. So I'm really big. I mean, I, t I teach basically fine art. So learn the rules. Learn the rules so you can break them. Start off photographing you know, in broad daylight in the summer, this time of year. You know, the best time of light. 
The best time of year to photograph infrared is right now. And it'll go right into early fall. Um, but I did this whole series called uh, Ice Queens, where I photograph people in the snow and on ice and infrared. But if you don't understand infrared and the contrast that it needs, you're going to have trouble getting um, uh, images that are strong. I taught in the Midwest one year and I wanted to get uh, fog. And it was a really foggy day. I almost did not take this picture when the infrared, but I liked the mood. So infrared can be used for mood. This was bracketed because if I just went with what the meter said, it would have been too much gray. Again, photograph right into the sun, but use a palm or use something to break it up so that, it'll, it, so that you won't get that flare. Again, this really isn't a traditional infrared fe a scene, uh, scene because of the, there's not a lot of infrared foliage, there's none. And I like the drama of the clouds and it's just a tumbleweed that I stuck into a rock. Again, this too is at very low light. This is in Santa Fe, uh, up in the uh, highlands. And so I just like the clouds. I thought the clouds added a lot of drama and it just lives, gives that spiraling look. And so if there was a lot of light on my scene, it would have not worked as well. This too, very backlit. It's not something you do with infrared, but to me this image really works. It's very interesting. It almost looks like a face with hair like mine on it. Composition, it's all about the composition. I knew, look at the striations of the clouds. And then look at the, I think, are these cypress? You know, the mangroves, mangroves right. The mangroves, the, the, the roots coming down. So I like that repetition. And then the sky, the clouds bring your eyes all the way down to the mangroves and down into the water. So you got to look at the composition. That's what I see people not doing right now. They're not looking at composition. They're getting so enticed by this really cool thing, which is infrared. So learn the composition. It's different. Negative space, negative positive space. Does everybody know what that is? Anyone not know what that is? Okay, so everyone knows what it is. Um, the negative space, like the, like the rocks become the positive space. You look at the rocks and then everything else becomes the background. But if you look at the clouds coming out of the rocks, what happens? That's what's interesting. That becomes the positive space. So I think one of the biggest challenges and most wonderful compositional tools with infrared is figure negative ground, negative positive space, figure ground. Um, this one, I have the slides not in order, so I apologize. I just love this. I love the wispiness of the moss. This is upside down. This is right side up. It looks like a different thing, doesn't it? Different picture. So, um, corn. These, this is late fall. Um, very graphic. I knew the sky would go black because there were no clouds. There was no haze. And I knew that it would be very dramatic. And then I also knew because of the way the sun was hitting the corn, it would become white. So it was kind of a dance and a repetition of these four stalks. Where was the sun on that? This one or this one? That one. Um, it was coming off from the side, more behind me. It was low, really, really low. Yeah, you can see where some of the shadows are. Um, every, I don't know why I'm cutting off. So everything in your image should be there for one or two reasons. One is composition and the other is content. People don't do this. You know, it's like I'll see a styrofoam cup in one of my students' images and they'll say, I'll say, what is, why is it there? Well, it was just there. Does it add to the composition? Does it add to the content? If it doesn't, why would you include it in your picture? It's the same thing with tonalities. Um, I'm very emotive with my photography, so I, I was at the Cloisters photographing at Mother's Day and my kids just left on a cruise and I was all alone and I was a little depressed. So I decided that I was feeling moody. So I went out and photographed moods. And infrared, why I love it is it's dramatic, it's moody, and there's always a little bit of magic that happens. So I'm using a diagonal line that leads up into the picture and leads your eye all the way around. And I feel that this image really works that way. And it, and it really, it, it gives, you know, kind of like this harsh, interesting feeling that's interpretive. I waited a really long time. Can you see the, the plane? You can't? Yep. yep. So I wait, I love this clouds. clouds. Clouds are a great way to start doing infrared because you really learn a lot. 
um, the patterns where the sun is, flare, stuff like that. So I waited for the plane because it gave a reference. It gave a size, a scale. Um, now we also photograph a lot with structures when we're doing um, landscapes. So structures do not emit any IR. They absorb. They're, cone, they're cold. They're stone. They're you know wrought iron. So they're going to go dark. But I thought it was kind of neat the contrast between this hedge and how this um, railing has just totally merged into the image. This picture, if you see on the right side, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, fifth one in. There's a bird. Um, you, probably, you might not be able to see it, but I took it from this angle. I originally wanted to have a lot of light on the trees, but I didn't like the sky. It wasn't dramatic enough. So that's another thing. When you get a scene you like, walk around 360 degrees. Sometimes we just take the most obvious. Simple. I think infrared sometimes the simpler the better. This is just a willow, a dead willow branch dripping down from the sky and the repetition of all of the... Um, the lines from the vineyard. Now again, this would look totally different in black and white or in color. So when you're shooting, like I prim predominantly only shoot infrared. So I know, I pick scenes, but if I have color and infrared going, one's going to work good for infrared, one's going to work good for color. So after capture. Um, there, oh my god, it's like when you're doing something in Photoshop, how many different ways can you do something in Photoshop? Yeah. It's no different. It's no different. Okay, so this is um, this is off of a Canon point and shoot camera that do, it's the S90 that does do raw. And this this is pretty much this is Victoria in Africa. My son took these pictures, and you can see there's you can see the flare. He added some gold and brown tone, but there was very little else that he did. This is like an, um, in Nick filters, you can, in other filters, you can play around with After Effects so that you get these, um, this looks like an alternative process image. Okay, this is Color Enhance off of the 720. His camera is off of, also 720. So you can get colors with 720s. This image works without the color. So make sure your image works without the color, then add the color. Channel swapping is huge right now. And you go, you swap the red and the green, and you know, there's, there, there's formulas, or just do it yourself, play with it, you can't go wrong. So you go from here to here. But also this image really works because it's a maze. It leads your eye all around. So every, the shapes in between the blue make sense. So all of that really helps. Um, this is off of my 720, it's through a window. I thought that was this is terribly boring. It's not really an infrared shot, but I split toned it. And you can't probably really see in this, but it has blue in it, and it, I added a little bit of grain and noise. So um, what, I, what we do is we take the image, we go right into um, Photoshop to Camera Raw. I do the basics in there. We do have some, if you go onto my website, uh, we will be putting up some, uh, you know, like um, a workflow. I do use McFun. I am an affiliate there. It's just my name. McFun's fun. Oh my God, that's out of rod. But McFun and Nick Filters, depending what you're looking for, really works very well for post-production. Um, and digital silver imaging. How many of you printed your own uh, infrared years ago, a film? So we were doing it on um, silver gelatin prints. So I'm sure other places are doing it. Um, this is just who I use. So they have a machine. They do gelatin prints, and they also do selenium toning. So it's as close that I've seen to what the film was like. Thank you very much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.